in shipping. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the, the threat, the impact and the cost of serious crime of this kind in Australia um, is real. There is a significant amount of information that indicates that serious and organised criminals who are based in Australia um, are controlling the illicit markets that can serve to fund a broad range of criminal activities and that they do pose a real risk to Australians. Um, organised criminals um, are gaining a major source of their revenue from the illicit drug market and, quite frankly, anything we can do to ensure that our airports and seaports are not safe havens for serious criminal activity um, are they're, they're important goals. They're objectives worth chasing. The Australian Institute of Criminology has estimated that the cost in 2016 to 17 of the crime of this nature, serious organised crime, is between $23.8 billion and $47.4 billion. It's a cost that we expect will continue to rise, and so it is really important that the government puts measures in place to prevent serious crime um, so that we can provide for the safety and security of all Australians. Now, I understand the point that you make is in relation to the foreign flag vessels, as distinct from um, the Australian-based people um, who carry an MSIC card. Um, I've indicated already in my answer to Senator Keneally um, the ways in which the um, maritime crew visa involves criminal history checks and security assessments to ensure that the risk on that front is mitigated. Um, and the regime proposed in this bill is about strengthening the checks that apply to those who are based on Australian soil. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, I came into this place and I you know, discovered that my office was with um, Senator Leinhelm. Um, I took over his office and I did the appropriate smoking ceremony to try to cleanse it a little bit. Um, actually, I did it more than once. Um, and I'm not sure how it went, but I do actually think it may be one thing that it did impact me on, uh, impact me, was that he actually thought this proposal that's been put up by the government wasn't worth voting for. Because a very similar bill that was put up before by this government. Now, what's quite, quite clear, and that is that we've got a situation here where they're not really about dealing with problems on our waterfront or problems on our border, because there's quite clearly a whole series of significant weaknesses in our border security when it comes to drugs. What they are about is sounding like they're doing something. And what do you do when you want to sound like you're doing something? You take somebody's right off them. You no longer presume that they're innocent before proven guilty or proven innocent. In actual fact, you turn around and say that work is because of someone's intelligence. Intelligence is given by vengeance. It's given by because someone's active in their union. Intelligence, which doesn't appropriately turn around and hold those people making those accusations to account. Now, there's a whole series of systems that can hold these people to account that turn around and make false accusations. But guess what? You don't get told what they are. Because when you don't get your MSIC and your ASIC, you no longer have a job. You're terminated. That's the presumption of innocence when it comes to this government. Oh, oh wait a sec. There's not always just that presumption of innocence. In actual fact, the government has a very different view about presumption of innocence. Because when it comes to the rule of law, and the minister representing the Attorney General says, we'll do anything we can. But when it comes to Christian Porter, it isn't the rule of law, is it? Because you have to have the presumption of innocence. Because heaven forbid, he's an Attorney General. And God, they're only port workers. So let's just go on the intelligence and get them sacked. Let's just turn around and treat them differently. Because it's not Christian Porter. Why shouldn't we treat them differently? Well, quite clearly, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General like to go on about the rule of law, just like you earlier today in the ABC, yeah. Senator Stoker. 
We said the rule of law, people should be presumed to be innocent. But what we're saying here, and what you're doing, is turning around and that, taking away the presumption of innocence. People don't get their work. They get terminated. They get held over. They don't turn around and able to work. That's taking away presumption of innocence. That's the worst thing you can do to a working person who's supporting their family. Destroy their livelihood. But don't worry, it's the rule of law here. And what did Christian Porter say about the rule of law? My guess is that if I was to resign, and that, set a new stand, that would set a new standard. Well, there wouldn't be much need for an attorney general anyway, because there would be no rule of law left to protect in this country. So I will not be part of letting that happen. Then Scott Morrison said, there is not some other process. Don't worry, it goes, it goes larger than Christian Porter. There is not some other process. There is not the mob process. There is not the tribe has spoken process. That's not how we run the rule of law in Australia. No, what you, the way you run the rule of law is you turn around and make accusations which can't be tested, can't appropriately be held to account this government. And when people lose their livelihood, except when it comes to Christian Porter, it's a very different scenario. My question is this, will you apply the rule of law to these workers and give them the presumption of innocence? Thank you. It being 9.50 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. Sorry, the committee reports to the Senate. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Seward. Thank you, President. I rise tonight to speak on the recent Australian, Law Australian Lawyers Alliance report doing more harm than good, the need for a health-focused approach to drug use. This is an excellent report. I would recommend that people have a very good read of this report. The report so clearly demonstrates how drug policies across Australia are ineffective and, in fact, causing harm. Current policies target and stigmatise people who use drugs. This sends people who use drugs fearful of law enforcement underground. People who use drugs become reliant on drug suppliers, not just for the drugs themselves, but, as the Australian uh, Lawyers Alliance pointed out, also for any information about what they are taking and how they should use it. This fuels a dangerously unregulated drug market, and people of all ages and backgrounds are dying as a result. It's very clearly pointed out in this report. With this context in mind, it is little wonder that people who use drugs are less likely to know where or even if they can seek help. This effectively denies chronically ill Australians the medical treatment and health support they need. For years now, many medical and public health experts have been advocating for a shift in the focus of drug policy from criminal law enforcement to the broader health and social issues associated with the harmful use of drugs, again, as is pointed out in the report and has in fact been starting to occur elsewhere on the planet. Uh, the report points out that Australia's current approach, with its emphasis on criminalisation, has shown little success in reducing illicit, illicit drug use. This approach has failed to address rates of recidivism among people who use drugs and has failed to reduce the number of people overdosing on drugs. In fact, criminalisation ex exacerbates people's disadvantage, resulting in further financial distress, mental ill health and difficulties finding and keeping housing. In my home state of Western Australia, Wanada, who is the WA uh, Drug and um, Alcohol um, organisation, they're the peak body uh, for the sector in uh, Western Australia, reported in their 2020 state budget submission approximately 30 to 50 per cent of people accessing mental health services have co-occurring issues with alcohol and other drug use. The criminalisation of drug use also increases the level of stigma associated with drugs and, and further marginalises and excludes people who, are, who use drugs. Prohibiting certain drugs is inherently stigmatising because it conveys a message that certain drugs are bad and therefore so too are the people who use them. 
As a result, criminalisation and prohibition have been unsuccessful in addressing the various social problems associated with substance abuse, again clearly pointed out in the report. For more than half a century, governments have aggressively pursued a disastrous war on drugs. Uh, this policy uh, that criminalises a health problem and has only succeeded in making things worse needs to change. There are many alternative approaches to criminalisation that I urge both the federal government and state and territory governments, who are also responsible for uh, making uh, laws in associated with drug use, uh, urge them to seriously consider these. And these are pointed out in the report. De Decriminalisation removes the use or possession of a prohibited substance from criminal offences and implements a range of civil and administrative measures to deal with the conduct. In this case, there is a state response designed to deter the conduct from occurring again. For example, similar to traffic violation, where a fine may be issued to, de to deter the conduct. Legalisation is another area to consider. This removes the criminal offence for the use or possession of substances or a and does not replace it. Regulation of the use and possession of substances involves a regulatory model of prescription, pharmacy or licensed sales. This could take the form, for example, of the medicinal, medicinal cabin, uh, cannabis market. The Australian Lawyers Alliance strongly support the decriminalisation and preferably legalisation of the possession and use of illicit substances. It is evident that de decriminalising or legalising drugs does not increase use but instead allows harm minimisation policies to be put in place that produce better outcomes for users. As more and more countries recognise the failure of criminalisation as a policy response to substance abuse, the evidence for effectiveness of health-focused harm minimisation strategies is becoming more apparent. But Australian states and territories have been cautious in their approach by comparison to these countries. There are significant benefits to adopting internationally recognised harm minimisation policies, again pointed out in the report. For example, the costs associated with criminal, the criminal justice system are reduced, meaning public funding and resources could be redirected into health and social services. In other words, treat this issue as the health issue it is. There are also um, reduced numbers of people in the criminal justice system where many people end up for minor offences. In WA, more than 80 per cent of prisoners and offenders appearing before the courts were identified as having problems associated with substance use. Finally, it enables individuals to address the health and social problems that often arise from illicit uh, substance use. 94 per cent of people accessing alcohol and other drug services have reported lifetime exposure to homelessness. It is time for reform. We, we need urgent leadership on national drug law reform to explore the range of op options to decriminalise, depenalise, leg uh, legalise and regulate our current approaches. This will enable the diversion of government funding and financial resources from law enforcement, prosecution, prosecution and incarceration into health and social services. It, is, it will also ensure that the inherent dignity of people who use drugs will be respected and promoted by removing the criminalised stigma associated with illicit drug use. The government has a responsibility under the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to ensure that everybody has the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health and under the Australian Charter of Healthcare Rights, which promotes that all people receiving healthcare in Australia have the right to receive safe and high quality care is an effective continuum. Tonight, I'm calling on state and territory and federal governments to abandon their current uh, approaches, which have failed. Prohibition and, criminalisations of sub and criminalisation of substance abuse has not worked. Embrace decriminalisation. Take a harm minimisation approach. Invest in public health and social services to address drug use, the causes of addiction and the associated social and health effects. All governments in Australia must stop and think about the approach they have taken. Analyse it. 
It is not working. It is time that we developed a new approach. We need to be taking a harm minimisation approach. We need to be addressing this issue as the health issue that it is. We can be helping and supporting people. We need to stop criminalising and stigmatising people who use drugs. It is time to stop devoting precious public resources to criminal law enforcement and to start working together to build a harm minimisation approach that treats alcohol and other drug dependent, dependents as the health issue it is. The national government, the Commonwealth government, should and must be taking leadership here. State and territory governments also need to be taking leadership. And look to the work that is being done internationally. Look at what works and look at how we can better support people where we don't stigmatise people and we ensure that drug addiction, drug use is treated as I keep repeating because I want to ram this message home. This is a health issue and needs to be addressed as such. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to say a few words on the passing of Sir Michael Samare. He was a towering figure in the history of Papua New Guinea, a driving force for the development of PNG's national constitution, that nation's first prime minister, the longest serving prime minister, holding office for a total of 17 years over four separate terms, Papua New Guinea's longest serving member of parliament, faithfully representing the East Pacific constituency for a remarkable 49 years. To his fellow countrymen and women, he was simply the Grand Chief. It was a title that reflected his immense standing and the deep respect in which he was held. To Australia, Sir Michael was a long-standing and respected friend, indeed family, because Papua New Guinea, our closest neighbour, is family to Australia. The ties are deep, forged and remembered at Kokoda, Port Moresby, Milne Bay, Lae, Rabaul and, of course, Bamana, by the many Kiaps, those young Australians who patrolled and worked with local village communities, walking across their vast and rugged interior, because it was once a territory of Australia. Indeed, we defended it with their help during the Second World War. Sir Michael's successes in building consensus and building relationships across the region meant that he developed strong ties with successive Australian governments and leaders, from Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser through to Bob Hawke and John Howard. But his connection to the leadership of our country goes back to the Gorton government. As a young man, Michael Samare championed an independent Papua New Guinea, and he did so working with Australia, working together, something that would characterise his time. It is to the great credit of so many Australian and Papua New Guinean leaders in the late 1960s and early 1970s that they came to a shared recognition that sovereignty must rest with the people of PNG. So it was right that many years later, Sir Michael and John Gorton and Gough Whitlam came together to receive honorary doctorates for their work in delivering independence because on the day when Papua New Guinea became independent, the Australian flag was respectfully lowered. Unlike in so many other places, it wasn't torn down. One of those who witnessed that significant moment was a future Governor-General of Australia, Michael Jeffrey. In 1975, he was a young soldier. He said of his time in East Sepik, later, I well remember the Australian flag being lowered for the last time and the beautiful Papua New Guinea flag being raised in its stead. He recalled a positive spirit that surrounded independence, which was in large part a great credit to Sir Michael Samare. He wasn't a man who tore down. He understood that free nations are built on democratic institutions, and what he called sana, a word from his own language signifying peace, consensus and inclusion. Indeed, I hope he'll remember, be remembered as those being the hallmarks of his public life and legacy. Thanks to his vision and commitment to SANA, PNG's path to independence was a smooth one. 
It's a nation still growing, of course, but the foundations of this new nation were laid in peace. Sir Michael remained a defender, proudly, of his country's independence, but he always appreciated Australia's unfailing commitment to his homeland and to PNG's success. He carried the Olympic torch when it passed through PNG on its way to Sydney in the year 2000, and we can only hope it will pass through PNG again if Brisbane in the year 2032 is to come to fruition. He was also, like so many Papua New Guineans, a great rugby league fan. Unlike so many Papua New Guineans, when it came to state of origin, he was a devoted fan of the Blues, but I'm sure that's something um, that we can grant him a little grace on, on behalf of Queenslanders. He was a great man of faith. He was a man of conviction and commitment, and he'll be deeply missed by many friends in Australia. One of those friends who knew him well is um, now a judge of Australia's uh, Federal Circuit Court. And he recalls meeting Sir Michael many times over the years. He had a gravelly voice, said Judge Egan, an engaging manner, was always courteous and polite, and he genuinely took an interest in what people had to say. He recalls meeting Sir Michael at a Christmas party in 1976 in Port Moresby, overlooking Stanley Harbour. Judge Egan's brother had just been appointed as Papua New Guinea's first post-independence director of public prosecutions shortly after the Declaration of Independence, and the now judge was staying with him during the holiday period he had from his time studying at the University of Queensland. Present at the party were a number of Sir Michael's contemporaries from the University of Papua New Guinea, of whom there were two important members of what became known as the Gang of Four, who from the beginning of autonomous government were the departmental heads responsible for administration in Papua New Guinea. Sir Michael openly discussed there, even among the company of Australians, the challenges that were faced by PNG. He spoke of the need to bring people together in a cohesive one from the often hostile ethnic, ethnically diverse groups that were widely scattered throughout the country. And what impressed about him was his absolute determination in all he did to do everything in his power to make sure that PNG, with all of its untapped natural resources, would benefit from what he said, quote, sensible and sustainable development, a term much before his time and that is now well used throughout Australia and in places such as this quite often. Thirty-five years later, in August 2011, Sir Michael's last term as Prime Minister came to an abrupt end when, by a majority vote in Parliament, Sir Michael's appointment as Prime Minister was terminated on the erroneous ground of incapacity. Sir Michael had had complications following heart surgery in Singapore, and during his convalescence he was replaced in haste by um, Peter O'Neill. Though that appointment was later ruled by the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court to be invalid and unconstitutional, Sir Michael was prevented from returning to his prime ministerial duties for the balance of his term, even though he had recovered and returned to Port Moresby. It was following the termination of Sir Michael's prime ministership that I was briefed, this is um, Justice Egan's words now, as overseas counsel, to represent Sir Michael in the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea in proceedings that were colloquially referred to then and indeed now as the two Prime Ministers' case. It's fascinating for the lawyers in the room, but um, it commenced with a view to overturning what was understood at that time to have been the usurpation of his Prime Ministership. Judge Egan had been admitted then as overseas counsel in PNG and often it appeared in that jurisdiction. He spent a week there marshalling evidence and settling affidavits from medical and other specialists designed to satisfy the court that though he had been temporarily incapacitated, he was not uh, relevantly labouring under any disentitling incapacity, as that word was understood under the PNG constitution. Judge Egan recalls him 
as a person who could speak to anybody, someone who greeted people with happiness and someone who felt deeply that his removal as Prime Minister was a wrong which needed to be right, lest it be seen as creating a worrying precedent that would jeopardise the robust democracy into which he had invested so much. It was then that Judge Egan was surprised to hear him suggest that he, um, that he and the Prime Minister, Sir Michael, should go for a walk so he could show the impressive hotel gardens. He rose to his feet and the judge offered to take his arm to help him. But with an unmistakable steely glance, he thanked the judge for the offer but said it was important he get to his feet by himself and insisted he walk unaided. He then insisted on telling all the judges that he was able to do so. <laughs> That's precisely what he did. And he won his case, but his determination to win was not for himself, but for his people, and that was a characteristic he exhibited throughout his life. The whole of PNG is in a period of mourning, but it was very important to see the flags lowered to half-mast here in honour of the soul and the rest of that soul. Order, Senator Vale, Stoker. the Grand Chief. Thank you, Senator Stoker. The Senate stands adjourned, and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.